Chapter 12, Valencia. There is a special light in the hallway that blinks when someone rings the doorbell. This morning I wake up and see it flashing through my half-open bedroom door. I'm not sure what kind of sadist rings doorbells at 7.30 on a Saturday morning, but I'm going to find out because I'm the only one awake. I can tell by the way the house feels, like even the walls are asleep. I walk down the hall in my bare feet. I don't bother with my hearing aids. A man with a salt and pepper mustache and a girl with brown eyes and freckles are at the door. They have pamphlets tucked under their arms. I can tell they aren't lost. They look like they are just where they need to be, which is strange because I've never seen them before. The man says hello and introduces the both of them, but his mustache makes it hard for me to understand him. I think his name is Craig or Greg, and her name is something indecipherable with an E, maybe. Something that doesn't make your lips move, like Enid. Before he and his mustache go any further, I point to my ear and shake my head to show that I'm deaf. And he looks at me like I just sprouted vines from my head. Then he hands me a pamphlet in a big hurry, and he and the freckled girl step away from the door and wave goodbye. He moves his mouth in such an exaggerated way that I can see all his teeth when he says, Nice to meet you which is really easy to lip read because everyone says it. I can tell he's saying it really loudly as if that would make a difference. As they walk away, the girl turns and looks at me like I'm a zoo exhibit. I think about sticking my tongue out at her, but I don't. They're going to have a rude awakening anyway because they're headed next door to Mrs. Franklin's house and she doesn't like when people come by unannounced. Plus, Mrs. Franklin has three cats and they're the meanest cats you ever saw. I have a feeling those cats would claw that man's mustache off if Mrs. Franklin told them to. I close the door and look at that pamphlet. It looks like something for church. On the outside it says, in great big letters, only those who listen to the word can hear it. That's kind of funny, all things considered. But it's really a shame that Greg Craig didn't stay to talk to me because I bet there aren't many people who would be willing to listen especially since they're going around ringing doorbells at 7.30 on a Saturday morning. I would have listened, though. Had they stayed, I would have asked all about their church and what kind of things they do, and I would have asked if they thought God was a boy or a girl or an old man with a white beard, and I would have asked if they knew about St. Rene, and if they didn't, I would have told them, and maybe I could have made them coffee because I know how, and I would have asked what time their church service has started and if they baptize people, and if so, how, but... Instead, I'm staring at the pamphlet like an idiot. I toss it in the kitchen trash because I know neither of my parents will care. My dad comes down the hallway. He's scratching the back of his neck the way he always does when he first wakes up. Who was at the door, Cupcake? I can tell that's what he says because it's a logical question and he always calls me Cupcake. I should probably hate it because it's a babyish name, but I hope he calls me Cupcake even when I'm really old, like 30. Church people, I say. I pull the pamphlet out of the trash and show it to him. He rolls his eyes. What do you plan to do today, he asks. Then he yawns and walks toward the pantry. He's going to make himself a bowl of cereal. That's what he does every morning. Sometimes he even eats cereal for dinner. No one eats more cereal than my dad. And he likes the real sugary kind, the ones that make your teeth rot, at least according to my mom. For some reason, it really irritates her that he eats so much cereal. She says it's not real food. I'm going out to explore with my zoological diary, I say. I don't mention the part about going to see Kaori. Turns out, my need to find a cure for nightmares outweighs my fear of maniacs. I've decided to take my chances. My appointment is at 1 o'clock. One sharp, actually. Apparently, Kaori Tanaka is very serious about being on time. Which makes me think she's not a killer. I don't think punctuality would be number one on her list of worries if she was. For added protection, I didn't give her my real identity. When she asked, I told her my name was Renee. She asked for my last name, but I said, it's just Renee. I couldn't think of a fake last name fast enough. I returned to my room as my dad pours milk over his cap and crunch. Maybe I'll fall back to sleep. It's still early, and I'm not ready to be awake. I shake my crystal caverns globe, then get under the covers before the bats settle back down in the water. Kaori told me she lives on the other side of the woods. That's good news because it's not far. 
Otherwise, I don't know how I would make it to her house. It's also great luck because I know the woods like the back of my hand. I know there's a special clearing where groundhogs come out at dusk. I know there's an old abandoned water well that's missing its broken pail, which tells me that the woods used to be an empty field where someone had a house, which means that the trees are young, at least as far as trees go. There are sycamore, pin oaks, and poplars. I know there's a cluster of trees with leaves that turn brilliant shades of yellow in the fall. It's one of my favorite places, and it's where I do most of my journaling. I've even walked the whole length of it and come out the other side, into a neighborhood. Maybe. I've even seen Kaori's house before. You never know. She should put a sign in her yard or something. Drum up more business. I close my eyes and I think about that pamphlet. I wonder where Mustache's church is. I wish I'd asked him. Oh, well, I can pretend I'm in church. I imagine that I'm sitting in a pew. Would Mustache's church have pews or chairs? And looking up at a big, big altar, talking to St. Rene. He doesn't look at me like I have vines sprouting from my head because he understands. I try to picture St. Rene wearing hearing aids in both ears like I do. Dear St. Rene, I say, I've been thinking about that whole going solo thing, and I'm not sure it's the best idea after all. It'd be nice if I didn't have to go to Kaori Tanaka's house alone, just in case she eats 11-year-olds for breakfast. I didn't have the nightmare last night, which is good because I need to be alert. Kaori may or may not be a mass murderer. If she is, please protect me. Thank you. Amen. I'm not sure if I'm supposed to say amen or not, but it sounds good. So amen.